all have these diverse experiences, which are going to bring different perspectives. And when all of that's put on the table, then we can make something magical happen. Hey, welcome back. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Experts Unleashed. Joel Irway here. I am super excited with today's episode. I have a very special guest who is um, very well accomplished, has written a couple of uh, best-selling books. Our guest today is Alden Mills. Now, Alden is a three-time Navy SEAL platoon commander and was the CEO of Perfect Fitness, uh, one of the fastest growing companies in America. He's the author of Unstoppable Teams, The Four Essential Actions of High Performance Leadership, and Be Unstoppable, The Eight Essential Actions to Succeed at Anything. A longtime entrepreneur with more than 40 patents and more than 25 years of experience working with high performing teams. He lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Alden, welcome to the show, my man. Hey, it's an honor to be here. I love what you're doing here. So really, it's a treat to be on the show with you, Joel. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Of course. Now, we chatted briefly uh, before we hopped on the call a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the background of, of uh, what you've got going on now. But I would love for you to, uh, I want to dive into this interview uh, because you're very, very successful, very well accomplished. And the whole goal of Experts Unleashed is to share with our audience the journey of how you became a successful entrepreneur, how you, came, uh, how you became who you are today. Can you give us a little bit more background of, of, of where you came from? And uh, let's start there. Absolutely. So the first piece of this puzzle is, you know, I grew up in a small manufacturing family in central Massachusetts. I had watched my great grandfather. I mean, I didn't see him start it, but I watched him at the end of his life running this business that he started out of his garage in 1926. It wasn't a fancy business. It was polishing pads and things. And so I was always interested in widget development. Fast forward, I one of my first platoons, I am sent to be on a submarine for what turned out to be 50 days. And I'm trying to think of ways to keep my mind active while I'm on the submarine because we weren't doing lots of missions. We have a lot of downtime. And I challenged myself and I, you know what? I actually have this here. I was not prepared to have this, but I challenged myself with a sketchbook and I literally were like, okay, I am going to invent a new idea every single day while I'm on the sub. It was just something to challenge myself with, right? And uh, let me show you an idea. So I had all kinds of wacky ideas. Here's one. This was the buoy mate, right? It was a way to just deal with a dive buoy that we'd have to do during training mission. I, I came up with a a baby stroller thing. But the point was, I was just doodling things, but to keep my mind active and kind of get myself in the philosophy of creating new stuff. It didn't matter what it was. Fast forward seven more years, I'd gone to business school and I came out of business school and I thought, okay, I'm going to go strike it rich in technology and move to San Francisco. And I learned really quickly that I just wasn't in the software and I really was having a hard time. And I was about to leave because I had gone for the wrong thing. I had thought about going after the money instead of what I was really passionate about. And right as I'm about to go back into the military, my wife's like, you know, you'd always talked about starting this business. Why don't you take a little more time and think about it? So What I ended up deciding on was I'm going to go into a business that's going to be a part of my life, regardless if I worked in it or not. Now, the little bit of the backstory there was I was an asthmatic kid and fitness had been a really important part of my life to help me get asthma under control. And I was like, you know, I bet there are other people out there that have this same philosophy. If you take control of your body, you can take control of your life. And that became the mantra of the business that everyone knows as perfect push up and perfect pull up and perfect dab carver, but three things occurred there, right? I had, I had seen somebody in the family uh, be able to cart, chart their own destiny Two, I was, I was interested in widgets and I had developed a little bit of a muscle memory for creating new things. 
And three, I was really passionate about the industry of fitness. And when those three finally collided and I find, you know, my swim buddy, my wife was supportive enough, I went for it. And, and, you know, and by the way, everyone hears about the, the success of perfect fitness, but it was the overnight success that took 10 years, right? It, it wasn't like, oh, he's just smarter than everybody else. And, you know, and, and we had good timing and, and that's always a piece of it as well. So that's the journey in the nutshell. Let me ask you a question. Uh, we haven't had anybody on this show that has been in the widget space, mm-hmm. right? And you said earlier that you loved, you were attracted to widgets. Yeah. Why? Like, is there something like, why widgets? Like what was, what, what drew you to widgets? Uh, me, I, it was a, it was a tangible thing, right? You know, uh, here's one of my favorite. This is the, uh, this is the perfect push-up mobile, which has since been discontinued, but the handles come apart, right? And, and they click in on the side and it's this cool little, it was like a, almost like a steampunk kind of design, right? And I love the idea of actually seeing something go from back of the napkin to a tangible thing I'm holding in my hand. Uh, so that was then, right? And, and from there I was like, okay, I've done lots of different widgets. I mean, we've sold over 10 million units of these different ideas. And, and then I moved into the pet food space, which is a place that we're in today. Um, and I went in there because my, one of my joys are my Labradors. And one of them came down with hip dysplasia and I was sick and tired of sticking a pill down her throat. And one of my key swim buddies out of Perfect Fitness and I started this company called Presidio Pet. And that was a consumable product, right? So then I kind of shifted from a widget to a consumable. And now I'm really in the content space. And the reason I'm in that space is I got sick and tired of realizing that I could make all these different kinds of widgets, but people weren't taking the next step to actually work on their bodies. What I really needed was to create a widget that worked inside here. Like that's the most important widget and that widget is content and it's not just content, but it's an actionable series of steps that people can take to get over their own self-imposed limitations and go start living the life that they really imagine. So now you're working on mental widgets and helping people build their own, their own widgets, right? Inside, inside which is, which is one of the things I love what you're doing here. Right. I mean, I would argue that that's a lot about what you're doing is helping people get out of their own way and and go start to unleash their own expert inside and help others do it. What have you found to be difficult or challenging as you've gone through the three phases? Right. And and there's more phases, but I've outlined them as, you know, the, um, you know, uh, the perfect push-up with, with all those those products and going into the pet food space. And now you're in the education, the content, the information space, right? Mm-hmm. What have you seen are, what have you seen to be some similarities and also some some differences and, and challenging things between those three, those three markets? Okay, so I'll start with the similarity, most importantly. The similarity is I was passionate about every single one of those. I didn't pay off the pet story space, but we ended up creating this glucosamine gravy called fetch fuel that you would squirt on things. So I wouldn't have to stick a pill down her throat. And, you know, I was passionate about my dog. I wanted something that was a better way to do what was already out there. And if you ask yourself that question, you know, how can I make something better? Um, There's always ways to make something better. Right. But at the end of the day, I went into each of these spaces, not with, oh, I bet I could make X. It was, I bet I could help people with Y. And when you go in with the process of how can I better serve? How can I better help? What thing that could I do that could give back and make a more of a positive impact? That is the clear delineation across all three of them. Another clear delineation, and I'm going to uh, I'll dovetail off this slightly, but the other one is I want to direct contact with the consumer. 
right? Um, and people will call that the B to C space. Uh, we call it direct consumer, you know, the um, direct, you know, infomercials and everything along those lines. But there were times where we veered from that. We ended up going into retail. We had 33,000 retail doors just in the United States. And we started selling across the world and other retailers. That is a totally different animal than B to C. Yep. And I found myself struggling at times because I was too disconnected with the customer and my customer became from the Tesco's to the care force, to the Walmart's to the dicks of the world where I really wanted to get back to the Johnny's and the Annie's of the world of hearing how our product helped them achieve a dream. Mm -hmm. Right. And and by the way, we did the same thing in pet food. We did another change and we're like, okay, let's try and go to the independent retailer. And that's, in the independent retailer, you're a little closer, but you still have that middleman. In the cases where it's been most rewarding is when we're B2C and we have direct customer involvement. So we get to understand where we're being helpful and where we need to improve. Well, I'd only imagine that when you change who your ultimate customer is whether it's be you know direct to consumer or to the middleman like they've all got different motivations right so the much more different motivations and by the way the profitability is much different right yeah. and the systems that you need to deal with a walmart are a lot different than dealing with wally you know a single homeowner who's like hey i'd like to learn about your unstoppable course you know that's a different sale process and a different set of systems you need. 100%. What, which of the three did you enjoy most? Now, I don't want this to be like a loaded question, but I'm, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of impact to your end user and uh, feedback to yourself, like what have you felt has been kind of most rewarding of the three major markets that you've, you've entered? All of them have the same rewarding elements. One for me is the creation of yep. building something from nothing, right? Dealing with a blank piece of paper and then saying, hey, what if, what if we can do this? What, and how would that work? And then you get this thing, this product, this product that can provide value to somebody else. That's part one. Part two, which is the only thing that outweighs the creation is when somebody comes to you and says, this really helped me, thank you, right? That's what continually stokes my fire to be like, okay, I'm, I'm on the right path. We got to keep doing this. Let's replicate that again. You know, I, I really think from, this, this may sound a little too spiritual for folks, but at the end of the day, you know, we got this one life, right? And at the end of it, we're going to be sitting there going, all right, well, what did we do with it? Right? Did we just take? It was just all these things I wanted, right? I, I got the car or I got the zip code or I got the bank account. Those are all, you know, things that you maybe you think you earned them, but you're taking them, right? But what are the things that people are like, you know what? That person made a difference in my life. I'm going to go to that person's funeral because I'm paying my thanks because they helped make a positive impact in my life. To me, you want to play for that one, right? The secondary element. And, you know, those are the things that uh, at the end of the day that really get me inspired to keep creating and keep delivering value. So let's talk about now with uh, your info business or your, your information market that you're in? I would call it contentpreneurship. Contentpreneurship. I like it. I like it. What does your model look like here? Meaning you've got courses, right? You've got your books, you've got speaking. I don't know if you do any coaching, but like, what does, what does the business model look like for you on in this market? Okay. So actually I'm working on a course right now. I don't have okay. a course for sale. The very first thing that started for me when I made this shift from, you know, widgets and consumable widgets to the mental widget is I went on the speaking circuit five years ago. So I have a robust speaking business 
And at the same time, I had published a couple of books, Be Unstoppable and Unstoppable Teams, and then became an executive coach. And so I do one-on-one intense coaching. And now I'm looking to expand that into a series of unstoppable courses that are really based around how you lead yourself, how you lead others. And that's a whole series of mindset training shifts and as well as leadership training. And then we'll build out a membership community of what I call swim buddies. Uh, Swim buddy is a team used in SEAL team for the smallest team, right? Anybody out there that's a solopreneur needs swim buddies. Anybody who's an entrepreneur, who's an executive, they all need a trusted swim buddy. Mm -hmm. And, And that's one of the things I get a lot of joy out of is helping others rise up when they're thinking, oh, I can't do it, right? They get, they're stuck in their own fog and then you come in and help them part it and be like, okay, you got this, right? Whisper in their ear, get up, get after it. You can do it. You know, it's, I think this will be a great segue to kind of talk about your Navy SEAL career, your Navy SEAL, SEAL history. I didn't want to lead with it because I didn't want to sound too, too gimmicky because you've got a great story. But I'm curious. Um, there's, it seems to me that as of late, there are um, lots of former Navy SEALs that are coming out with information, businesses, speaking, et cetera, more so than I've noticed with any other branch of the military, mm. uh, David Goggins, Jocko, um, there's um, uh, Robert O'Neill, excuse me, he was, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, leaving my mind, I, for whatever reason, I couldn't bring up his name, but Robert O'Neill, what do you think it is about um, Navy SEALs that kind of separates you from the rest of the pack? Because I just, and maybe it's just me not being aware of other military branches that have been successful entrepreneurs. Do you think there's something with Navy SEAL specifically versus other branches of the military? Well, if you're asking that, I think like, Hey, are Navy SEALs, you know, better than some other branch, there are so many phenomenal components to our military from green berets and what they do to marine force recon to delta force to tf-160 and our helicopter pilots to the air force uh, special air force squadrons i mean no you know what is going on is you know the seals have gotten a lot of the limelight recently and uh, a lot of that limelight's gotten a lot of intrigue and there's lots of people that have a lot of great stories. You know, um, all those names you've mentioned all have great stories. You know, I am, I do not like to lead with the Navy SEAL. However, the moment they hear you're a Navy SEAL, they're like, oh, I want to hear the Navy SEAL stories. Um, I'm, I don't view myself as any kind of hero. I, you know, I had three great platoons. I felt very blessed to have it when I did. And I also don't like talking about the component of war with a lot of it. Yes, there's lots of um, metaphors on these kinds of things, but I find it more powerful to discuss the specific elements they do in training and how you can bridge what you, what they're teaching us in SEAL training to use to you as an entrepreneur or as an intrapreneur, right? I I really look at the customer base that I talk to in two areas, intra and intrapreneur. At the end of the day, you want to be free thinking, no matter what bureaucracy or organization, profit, nonprofit you're in. And the one great thing about SEAL Team is that you've got these three different environments that you're trained in, sea, air, and land, which is what SEAL stands for. Yes, they're very known for having some extremely hard training and they happen to be getting a lot of press on this right now. You know, for the long time, we've been viewed as kind of a, an intrapreneur of the Navy. So there are some really transferable things between SEAL team and what's going on um, in the business world. However, please let all the audience members know Whatever military person you have on the show, 
uh, whatever their branch is, they're not civilians, right? Seals and civilians, those are two different animals. I mean, we have a different legal system to deal with. How That being said, the mindset to get through some of the hardships that are sometimes um, created just for training, like the hardship of Hell Week, is very analogous for the hardship of launching a business, except Hell Week's just a week, right? You can have a hell year in business. Uh, some of the hardest things I've ever been through have been starting and growing a business, in particular growing a business when you have people that are relying on you to make the right decisions so their family is supported. So, yeah. And to be clear, where my question was coming from was definitely no sign of disrespect to any other sort of military. It was more along the lines of it seemed that I had seen more people in the business space come out as from the Navy SEAL. And so I was trying to find that correlation of yeah. was there any sort of transferable skills, which is what you had said, which is really the words that I was looking for with Navy SEALs versus maybe other branches of the military. And I think that you... I think that you had answered that. So um, just want to be clear on that question. But and, and, and I want to be clear in the response. Like, are SEALs a little more entrepreneurial on average? I would say they probably are. Yep. Uh, that doesn't make us a better soldier than somebody else, right? right? There's a whole bunch of other things that I'm not here saying, oh, yeah, we can uh, we kick Delta Force's ass every day and three times on Sunday. Like, no, 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 that's not at all. They're all brothers and they're all sisters and – um, feel very blessed to have everybody on that front line today. 100%. Absolutely. And if you're listening right now, uh, that was uh, um, I'm glad we uh, were able to kind of clear that up because I didn't want it to come off as mis yeah. mystery. So. No, I think it's a fair question. Yep. Because there, there are a lot of us out there today, right? There are. <laughs> so um, with the... Uh, of all the things you've been involved in, military, three different lines of businesses, where would you pick the, uh, uh, I'll, I'll classify them as four, like the three markets of business that you've been in plus the, plus the military, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you feel like you've learned the most important lessons to help you succeed with where you are as a, as a, um, as a leader today? Like where would you say the biggest lessons were uh, um, were learned. I'm sure you've you learned tons of lessons from all of them. I'm just wondering if there's like one or two that have really stuck out that are staples of, of and what you're, you... And you're, you're keeping me focused with those parameters, right? Seal and the three businesses? Unless there's another area that you want to you wanna pull out. Those are just the, the, the four that we've talked about on the podcast. But if there is another experience that you've that you've heard, I definitely want to include that 100%. So I, I would add two experiences on top of my answer of SEAL Team okay. was, you know, you give me just those SEAL Team uh, because the those directly transfer to the mindset of always looking to find a way to get something done. And then the two before that would be my mom and would be the sport of rowing. And the short story on my mom was that she was there in that doctor's office today. I was told I had asthma and I needed to lead a less active lifestyle and learn the game of chess. And I will never forget her dropping to a knee, taking her long fingernails, digging them into my forearm like a velociraptor claw, right? And saying, no one defines what you can or can't do. It's up to you. You have to decide what you can or can't do. Uh, of course, I didn't get it that day, right? But I was one of the lucky ones where my parents both kept saying that again. And so what if you scored your on your own basketball team? Go try another sport, right? You know, so what if you scored on your own team? And, and I did that against myself in uh, lacrosse and soccer. I mean, I was terrible at all these ball sports. But then I found the sport of rowing a couple of years later. And then rowing, and we're talking about eight people in a really skinny boat going backwards and getting these blades in the water at the same time. And the importance of selfless commitment and teamwork and the willingness to work so much harder than you originally thought you could 
those two laid the foundation for me to succeed in SEAL training. Mm -hmm. And then that would be my three-legged stool of places that I have learned and have used those experiences to then apply them and then learn more, you know, tactical details of starting businesses and all those things. Cause there's lots of tactics that you need there. Right. When would you say, cause you said when your mom told you that day, uh, when you found out that you had asthma and she said, no one defines what you can or can't do. That's up to you. You said that day, like it didn't make sense that day. Do you remember the day that it clicked? Like, was there a certain event that happened that said that maybe you were able to look back like, okay, well, this is what she meant by it. Or was there a certain event that kind of made that connection when you finally got it? I ended up having to get, uh, to go away to school for high school. And I got sent out of the state and it wasn't because I was necessarily a bad child, but uh, I probably needed a little extra discipline. And I remember going uh, around the corner as I was coming to this school and I saw these crew shells go rolling by. And it was at that moment where I would say to myself in the past, when I'd see a sport, I'm like, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. Right. I would say to myself, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I remember seeing that boat going, I can do that. I want to do that. And that little click between I can't and I can became a series of cascading I cans to other things, right? I can row. I can make that second boat. I can make that first boat. I can get recruited to the Naval Academy. I can row at the Naval Academy. I can try out for the Olympic team. I can try out for SEAL team. I can start a business, right? It was one little thing, snowball to another and another in a positive way. And I'd never actually been asked that question before, but that is exactly that moment is that I can still vividly see it. I can, I can tell you what the day was like. I could see that boat. I'm like, I can do that. And it, it was like recognizing a belief inside of me that just compounded on itself every time I fulfilled what I thought I could do. And I think that's anybody's entrepreneurial journey, right? They start off going, yeah, I think I can. I'm not sure, but I think I can. And they they get one success like, okay, that was pretty good. Let's do it better now, right? And when they start, the hardest part is flipping from I can't to I can. And, you know, Joel, that is a piece of why I'm on your show is your show is about telling people you can, right? They need that swim buddy that says I can. That's what my mom was for me. You know, she was my first swim buddy. You know, I, when you, I talk to entrepreneurs, I love getting those light bulb moments of like, when you had that vivid vision, like you, you, you even said it before, like I can still remember crystal clear, vivid vision of when I was walking down, I walked around the corner and I saw those crew, those crew boats row, rowing by, right? That is what I think is the biggest defining story of who we become. Now, like the main question that I've got, like leading up to that, like the next logical question that I have is, I know you're big in teamwork and and leading teams and developing teams. How do you deal with a team member that is running into that limiting belief? Probably like a a crew member or a Navy SEAL team member, right? That you've, you as the leader have the I can, I can mentality, but how do you deal with a teammate or somebody on your team that might be experiencing an I can't mentality and how do you get them to kind of flip? Because that's gotta be in my mind, it's gotta be difficult. It's probably easy for you, but it's. (laughs) It's not easy because everybody responds to it differently. Right. And you get the Navy SEAL coming in going, well, that's easy for you to say you were a Navy SEAL and you did this and you did that. Right. They immediately put distance between me and them. And the very first thing that I always do is kill them with kindness. I care for them and show them how much I care. 
And the more you show about how you care for them, and I'm not talking about giving them flowers and coddling them. I'm talking about caring about them as a person and, and their fear that they care about, right? You see, once people start to really feel cared for, that they know you have their back, they're going to start to surrender some of their fears about their limitations of they can't, but they're scared. They're scared. Mm. And it takes a long time in some cases for somebody to unpack some of these limitations, surrender that and say, okay, I trust Alden enough because I know how much he cares that I'm going to take this step, which feels like a step off the ramp of a C-130, right? They're jumping off the ramp. They got this parachute that they packed, but they don't even know if they packed it right. And they're worried. And I mean, it's, it's that kind of fear. And the more empathetic you can be as a leader to be like, hey, you know, the, the, the virtual I'm putting my arm around you going, I know this fear. I've been there. Let me tell you this story. That's the kind of care I'm referring to, right? And, and get them to understand that it's normal. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. And that together, I will not let you fail. You may look at a tactical failure as a failure. I don't. As long as you get back up and I help you get back up, it's just we learned you know, another way not to do something. The only failure is not getting back up. And when you start to give them that perspective of what failure really is, is that hallelujah, you are failing. And I will tell you, uh, I was a precursor to that in everybody that I ever interview and anybody that works with me, I do the interviewing or at least I'm involved in the interview process. I'll ask them, hey, tell me about your most spectacular failures. And I'll get all fired up and excited. And they look at me like, oh, uh, you know, and it's the people that go, oh, gee, you know, I'm really sorry, but um, I, I just really haven't had that many failures. I mean, I guess, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just that good or I've just been lucky. And I'm like, oh, really? Hmm. Well, you failed this interview. You know, have a good day. And the interview's over. But the people are like, oh, let me tell you about this one. I did this and I did this and whammo, I failed like that. I start to already set the tone before they've ever even come on to my team that, oh yeah, I've done a lot more failing than I have succeeding. You just hear about my successes. You didn't hear about the 10 years of failures to get the perfect push up out the door and all the products that came before that, right? And when you start setting the context of the type of teammate that you're gonna have, then your job is a little easier, right? It's when you haven't set the context and you think everyone has to be perfect all the time. And when they feel that way, they immediately narrow their focus on what they're going to be willing to take a risk on. Other way around. I mean, I'm not asking you to shoot from the hip, but I'm asking you to make decisions without perfect information. Right? That's what leadership is about. I want mm. you to make these risky decisions with it with a small amount of information, I mean, not minuscule, you know, I like how Colin Powell will say it, you know, between 40 and 70% of the information is all you're going to ever get. So that's, that's how to give you a little context when somebody does come and, and that happens still, right? Oh, gee, I don't know about this product. And we're like, well, let's put this in context. Let's look at this, but we're in this together. My name's on it too. Don't you worry about it. I love what you said there. Uh, I wrote it down. You said, once they know you have their back, they will surrender their fears of I can't because they're scared, right? And so that seems like that's, that's like it, right? They're scared. And that's yeah. why they, uh, they go from I can't to I can. That was really powerful. I remember as soon as you said it, I'm like, it's like somebody jumping out of a plane. And then boom, you said you had the analogy of, you know, the uh, C-130. I can't remember if that was the name of the, the plane. Yeah, it but, is, C-130. Yep. I, that was my first free fall jump. I, I often tell that story on stage um, yeah. because I think that's very analogous to anybody who's, you know, thinking that maybe they've watched your show and they're like, oh, you know what? 
I've always wanted to do this, but I don't know if I can do it. And, you know, and, and they're, 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 they're getting to the edge, but they haven't finally got there. And they get to the edge and they're like, oh, and then the instructor comes up, grabs her hand and says, okay, let's jump together. Now, the key thing is that when you're flying through there, the instructor doesn't grab your parachute ripcord for you. The instructor says, okay, now you got to open your parachute. And now we're going to fly it down. You're going to follow me, but you got to open your parachute. You have to do that, right? You have to be the one that actually takes the step. They're waiting for you in free fall school for you to take the step off of there. Because if you get pushed into it, and you do that a couple more times, you're like, okay, this, this really isn't for me, right? Yep. Everybody needs a nudge at the right time. But, and, and that, again, going back to why I wanted to be on your show is that's what you're doing here, right? There, there can be a bunch of people that are on the ramp. Maybe they're in flight. Maybe they're like, oh my gosh, I, my parachute didn't open. I got a malfunction and I got oh, to open my reserve and oh, I'm landing in the wrong spot or the winds have shifted because this thing called COVID's come across and now what do I do? We got you right? I'm a swim buddy for you. We can do this. We got to shift gears, but it's doable. You just have to get out of the mindset of, I can't. And now let's think of ways that I can. That's the, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate leap for, uh, somebody who jumps into entrepreneurship because so many people are stuck on that ledge because they're thinking of problems that don't yet exist. They're creating problems in their mind that may or may not happen. At least that's what I've experienced with yep. people that are in my tribe. They will come to me and they say, Joel, what, what about this? Or what about that? It's like, how do you know that's even going to happen? Yes, problems are going to happen, but they're creating problems before they even, before they even experience them. So I love that, uh, that shift from going from, I can't to I can. Uh, you know what I call those problems, Joel? What's that? Those are negative hypotheticals. Yep. And you're exactly correct. You know, we have this negativity bias. We have a tendency to emphasize negative over positive. Neuroscientists will say it takes somewhere between three and five positives to offset the negative. But then if negativity takes root... What ends up happening next is we have a series of cascading events in our head that then do if then statements. Well, wait a minute. If this happened, well, then that's going to happen. And when that happens, then this next thing's going to happen. Oh my God, I shouldn't even start this project because that's disaster, right? But they have extrapolated a series of hypotheticals that are so beyond what could actually happen. I mean, okay, maybe a 0.11111, you know, 0%. But that's a key piece of a coach. It's like, hey, hey, stop with the negative hypotheticals. Stay in the moment right now. Focus right now. What can I do right now? And I use this term called focus on the moment, not the mountain. Um, in my off time, I like to climb a mountain every year. And and I also, I tell the story about climbing Denali and Denali is a huge mountain, right? It takes 15 days to get there and you don't see the summit for a long time and it sucks, right? You're, you've got 120 pounds of gear, 65 pounds in your back and maybe like 130 pounds and 65 in the sled and you're slogging for days. You can't see the mountaintop. Do you think it is helpful to think about the mountain in front of you? No, no, you totally psych yourself out. You're like, wait a minute, it sucks so bad right now and I'm only on day two and I got to do this at higher altitude and steeper pitches and all, the oh, forget it, I'm out, man. Woo, game over, right? But that's the same thing with what we deal with in entrepreneurship. Oh man, I launched my product and nobody bought it. Oh, well, if nobody bought it, then I suck and my products suck and it just can't work. And, oh, this was a bad idea in the first place. And people are laughing at me. It's over. What? You only launched it yesterday. Come on. Anyhow, you see, you got me on a rant right now. Rant. 
because it's it's one every entrepreneur needs to needs to hear because it happens when you're launching it happens every part of business that I've been a part of right in my young business career I mean it's going to happen over and over and again it's just going to matriculate in manifest into different different forms different beings uh, dude we went on a, a little bit of a leadership uh, tangent there but it got me it, I loved it like it, I'm, I'm huge into leadership right now and and uh, and learning how um, how different styles of leadership and 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 different methodologies and your leadership it seems I don't want to paint a broad brush but using your own words you said kill them with kindness because there's lots of different forms uh, different forms of of leadership did you um, did you how do I ask this? I want to make sure I ask this question properly. When did you know that you wanted to be a leader of some sort? Was it before Navy SEALs? Was it when you were younger? Like when did you really get the drive to become a leader when you knew really what leadership was? Or maybe it was before you even really knew what leadership was. Here's how I look at leadership. And I call it the mirror effect in leadership and the most important leadership we can all have is how we lead ourselves. You see how we lead ourselves becomes a reflection of how we are going to lead our teams. Teams are nothing more than a reflection of how we lead ourselves, right? Let me give you a super simple example. We lead ourselves to show up five minutes to a meeting that we called for but we let ourselves to be five minutes late. What do you think that communicates to the rest of your team? It's okay to be five minutes late. He's five minutes late. It's not a big deal, right? It's okay to show up a little late for work. It's okay to push a deadline. It's okay to not really go all in because we got other things that are more important. It's okay not to push ourselves, right? Versus somebody who's like, Hey, if we're not five minutes early, we're late. Like it's, I value my time with you and I respect your time. I'm going to be there. How do people respond to that? How do people respond to you walking in saying, okay, we've got an unprecedented crisis right here. Let's figure out ways to lead in this and take an opportunity because we all know that they're equal and opposite forces in the universe, right? I didn't make that up. That's a law of physics. So for every amount of uncertainty, there is an equal amount of opportunity. So let's figure out how to go after it, right? How does that kind of leadership cascade? It happens from you, right? How you lead yourself. Like, I, I don't like the fact that a lot of people are like, well, I'm not a leader. I would almost swear right there. That's ridiculous. We are all leaders. The question is, how many are following you? Right? You are leading yourself to get out of bed every morning. You're leading yourself to uh, decide to watch this show. How many are following you because they like how you're leading yourself? Are you with me on this? Super powerful. That's super powerful. How many are following you because they like how you are leading yourself? That's what this is all about here, right? And why do we get so frustrated with some politicians? Why do we get so frustrated with some leaders versus others? You're like, hey, wait a second. We thought you were one thing and now you're a different thing, right? I tell this story uh, about SEAL training early on it's with this guy who had his uh, left butt cheek shot off by a rocket propelled grenade. And he's talking about lots of different things. But one thing he says is it ain't complicated. It's hard, but it ain't complicated. And what he's talking about is consistency. It's hard to be consistent. It's hard to show up early every time. It's hard to look 
at a positive outlook instead of a negative outlook. People would always say to me, well, you just had the positive gene. You know, you, you were just lucky to be positive. I'm like, I wasn't always positive. No, I had to make some really hard decisions when I was stuck and I got pulled out of SEAL training the first time around for an injury, lo and behold, with a lung infection. And I had to decide my own plight. Did I want to focus on the misery that loves company or do I want to make something magnificent go on here? And the only way I could do that was start to focus on the things I could control, right? You and I can talk to everybody until they're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that have got to make that step off the ramp. They're the ones that have got to finally decide, okay, I'm going to give up on that old I can't attitude and I'm going to try this thing. And I don't want them to just try it. It's not good enough to try it. I want them to go all in on it. They got to feel in their gut. I gave it everything I had and more than I thought. Cause you know what that's, that's what this is all about. Right. And you know how good it feels that exhaustion of when you've just given it your all. It was pure full agency of your soul. And you know, and you could, some people are like, oh my God, that sucked. And we're like, yeah, but it felt good, you know? <laughs> and it was worth it. And I, I think to- everybody can pull. Yep. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. I think everybody can pull down, pull through their, one of those stories, like one of those past experiences, like if they need motivation, like there's got to be one point in your life where you gave it your all you beat up, you know, you're beat to the ground, you're winded, feel like you're like, you, you literally are on your last thread, <clears throat> but you know, deep down it felt freaking good. Like regardless of what the outcome was, you're like that just feels invigorating. Yeah. I gave it all I had. And you know what? The next day you're going to be like, I'm going to do it again. Yep. And when we can help people build that kind of a habit, whew, well then you're unstoppable. You are. Because you'll look at every obstacle as an opportunity. You'll start to realize that it's all right in here, just in here, right? And then when you get a couple more people to get the same mindset of the leading that you're doing of yourself and you help them do the same kind of leading, now we're going to make a dent in the universe. That's amazing. So I want to ask one one final question before we wrap up because we're we are uh, we're coming to uh, the end of our allotted time, and I want to respect your time. Uh, the one thing that you had said regarding leadership that I want to get your opinion on. You said the real question is you said we're all leaders. The real question is how many are following you because they like how you are leading yourself. If I were to take that a step further, is it right to assume that people are following you? because they want to be like you or is that a false assumption? Like, are they, are they following you because they, they see that they want to be what you are becoming in, in, in terms of their vision or a version of, of you, or is that a false assumption? I would say there is a followership there because they trust you because there is a consistency of how you are leading yourself. Right. And that they are trusting what you're doing. I'm not making any assumption. Anyone's like, oh, I want to grow and be just like Alden. I don't want them to be like Alden. I want them to be their authentic self. But one of the things that I try to commit to every day is to be my authentic self, right? At the end of the day, I don't want a team of Aldens. I want a team of authentic people so I can get diversity of thought, right? That's why we're after diversity, It's not diversity just for the sake of it. We want the diversity of thought. We want the different perspectives. The reason people are clamoring about diversity, like, well, you grew up over here and you're from this culture and you know this skill, is that you all have these diverse experiences which are going to bring different perspectives. And when all of that's put on the table, then we can make something magical happen, right? The problem will then come back to the leader who's got an ego problem. It's got an insecurity problem. They're like, well, wait a minute. That person might have a better idea than me. I can't let that happen. I'm going to squash that person. 
I'm going to cut them off at the knees before they even get that idea out, or I'm going to steal that idea, right? Stealing that idea, it's going to last you one time because that other great idea person is out of there. They're like, what? But I, I, that was my idea. You didn't even give me credit for it, you know? And so when I talk about that, I'm talking about it from the highest level of, and when I mean followership, at the end of the day, a leader serves, right? I use this term all the time. To lead is to serve. To serve is to care. And the real followership is you serving others. And the people are coming to you to work with you, not for you. And the reason they're following you is that you care so much about them that they're giving and reciprocating on care to you. Man, Alden, we covered a ton of stuff today. This is a fantastic conversation, and it I went it. Uh, it went on a nice little little pivot at the end towards leadership. I told you I'm on a leadership kick, so I, I appreciate you being um, being open with with your thoughts on that. But just to do a quick recap of you know everything that we kind of discussed today. I mean, we discussed obviously your journey of uh, how you became not necessarily how you became an entrepreneur, but it was more along the lines of, you know, what you've accomplished, which was, which was fantastic. We even went back to, uh, you know, the stories and the events that happened in your life of, you know, you know, when your mom uh, told you like, Hey, no one defines what you can or can't do. That's up to you. That was obviously a very, very pivotal moment for you that led you to rowing. And then we talked about the series of events that happened to, you know, all those different can't to can moments that, developed you into, uh, developed who you are today. We then went into uh, uh, leadership. We talked about focus on the moment, not the mountain. Um, you know, it's obviously most important with how we lead ourselves. Uh, we asked the question, you know, how many are following you because they like how you're leading yourself? And that's ultimately because they trust you. Not that they want to be like you, but you want to build a team of diverse people and, and build a team of people who are showing up as their authentic self. And for me, that's a huge takeaway. As I'm learning this whole art of leadership, I always need to know the reason why, right? Why do I show up as a leader? Why do I show up consistently? And that was a selfish question for myself. Like, is it because people want to be like me? No, that's not the right answer. It's because we want to lead them to be their authentic self. They're looking at you for trust and they're looking at you to see who you really are. And that gives them the fear release this is my interpretation, by the way, but that gives them the fear release so they can show up who they're, as their authentic self. Those are the big takeaways that I got from this, from, from this conversation. I love it. I want a copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So let's drop some links. Where can people follow you? Where can people check out your, um, check out your stuff, your books? Uh, uh, where can they learn more about you? So I have a website, Alden dash mills.com and i am doing a daily swim buddy post right now on instagram tv at alden underscore mills so you see me do it six days a week i started doing it in the quarantine and uh, i get really passionate about helping people through this time period as not to survive but to thrive right Perfect. So they can find me there, alden-mills.com and alden underscore mills at Instagram TV. Excellent. We'll make sure to include those links in the show notes. Uh, if you are listening right now and you enjoyed this episode, I please, please encourage you, go check out Alden's sites, go follow him, go tune into his, uh, his daily swim buddy. And if you ever get a chance to connect with him, let him know that you heard him here on Experts Unleashed. Alden, thanks again, my man. Fantastic conversation. And uh, I appreciate you sharing uh, your knowledge and your wisdom and your inspiration with my audience. And until next time, we'll see you on the next episode. Take care.